Hello, this is Lisa, CEO of Site for White, welcoming you to this week's Talking News. On Thursday this week, at our Mix and Mingle group, we had the clowns all attending. The staff all dressed up and the ladies and gentlemen who had joined us had a thoroughly enjoyable time, all wearing their clown noses. It is, as I have said before, so enjoyable to see Millbrook House come alive again with members' laughter and cheer. On Wednesday, we had the coffee morning and on Friday, we had striders. All so easily and effortlessly organised by Susan, our members and volunteers manager. Week also saw the arrival of our new car. We were able to gain grant funding and we have got the new car on the road, picking up members to do individual activities with a door-to-door transport service available. With a short week coming up next week, we're all looking forward to attending Wolverton on the 4th and 5th of September for their annual show. This really is a very enjoyable show and hoping the weather will hold and it would be lovely to see as many people there as possible. Finally, I would just like to say another huge thank you to our volunteers. Without you, we simply wouldn't be able to run the activities that we do. The drivers, the escorts, the one-on-one guides and the ladies who come and help us on a Wednesday and a Thursday are so appreciated. If you would like to volunteer for Sight for White, please never hesitate to get in touch with us. We have volunteer roles always available. Thank you very much. Stay safe, Lisa. This is Michael reading from On the White. Planning committee members go against officers' recommendations for 149 new homes. The Isle of Wight Council Planning Committee members went against the officers' recommendation and rejected the scheme. Plans for 149 homes in Gunville were rejected last night, Tuesday the 24th, due to inadequate access to the development and the wider impact on highways. Local developers, DN Associates, said the hybrid application comprising outline plans for 113 houses and full plans for 36 would have bridged the gap behind the already existing development on Arthur Moody Drive and Forest Hills and recently approved and built developments. Against officer recommendations. Going against officer recommendations, the Isle of Wight's Council's Planning Committee argued the single point of access for the old and the new estate leading to Broadwood Lane was completely inappropriate. Councillor Vanessa Churchman said she was worried about how adequate the access was into the existing development, let alone adding to it. She said, I cannot understand how traffic coming out of that exit on Gunville Road would cause nothing but a traffic jam. It must currently be a nightmare. Adding houses is totally wrong. Resident. Effects would be truly devastating. Speaking on behalf of residents, Sue Cook objected for a number of reasons, saying the potential effects would be truly devastating. Agent. IWC under the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Andrew White, on behalf of the applicant, pointed out the Isle of Wight Council had failed to meet its housing targets and as such is under the presumption in favour of sustainable development so the council should only turn down applications for new housing if there was significant or demonstrable harm that would outweigh the benefits. Mr White said modelling suggested the development would only add four car lengths to the queues down Carisbrook High Street at the peak afternoon time. This would not be a strong highway safety reason for refusal. Island Roads Objections Island Roads objected to plans for the 113 houses due to the negative impact it would have on the wider highways network, especially at the Waverley Roundabout at the top of Carisbrook High Street. Highways engineer Alan Ransom said the junction would be exceeding capacity in four years before any more developments were approved. There was nothing that could be done to improve it, If the application were to be approved, Mr Ransom said it would only exacerbate the capacity issue. Price opposed to the scheme. Councillor Matthew Price, who proposed the motion to refuse the scheme, said he was struggling to see how they were considering Broadwood Lane 
has access for an extra 150 houses. Strategic Manager for Planning and Infrastructure Delivery, Ollie Bolter, said the council had been trying to find a more holistic highways solution in the area, all against outline plans. On the outline plans for 113 houses, all eligible committee councillors voted to reject the development on the grounds vehicle movements would result in significantly adverse effects on the capacity of the highway's network and construction traffic would compromise the residential amenity. Motion to approve 36 homes. Councillors were split, however, on the full permission for 36 homes, with some arguing the smaller development would provide homes the island needs. Councillor Chris Quirk proposed approval of the 36, with Councillor Jeff Brody seconding, but he said he was not absolutely convinced with the application. The proposal fell 6 to 3. Motion to reject scheme. Councillor Price proposed to refuse the application on the same grounds as the 113 houses, but was advised Island Rose had not objected to this part of the development. Councillor Michael Lilly said he voted against the first part as there was clear evidence that was defendable, but for the 36 houses felt it more questionable. The second application was also rejected. However, with the vote split 6 and 3 again, Councillor Brody Churchman, Price, Claire Richardson, Rodney Downer and Martin Oliver in favour of rejecting the development and Chris Lilly, Quirk and Michael Beston against. MP delighted. Following the meeting, Isle of Wight Conservative MP Bob Seeley said, I'm delighted that plans to construct 149 houses on Greenfield land in Gunville have been rejected by the Council's planning committee and I thank all those who campaigned against this development, including the former and current Isle of Wight councillors, John Hobart and Joe Lever, respectively, along with Matt Ambrosini speaking on behalf of the Community Council. I objected to these plans on the grounds that this development would have unnecessary and irreversibly removed more of the island's natural green spaces, increased traffic in the area and would not have met the housing needs of islanders. I want to have an island plan that takes into account the housing needs of islanders. We need to think more carefully about where we build and who we build for and with that in mind I encourage all islanders to respond to the island planning strategy consultation document to have their say on future housing building on the island. Now is the time to speak up and help shape the island's future. This is Petrina reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Newport Sainsbury Car Park undergoes refurb. Newport Sainsbury Car Park will undergo a refurb. The works will begin next month, September, and be completed next year. No further details have been revealed to Isle of Wight Council about what day the work starts or is due to finish. It is not known if customers can continue to park on the site while the upgrade takes place. The company told Isle of Wight Radio Islanders will be updated as the work gets underway. A Sainsbury's spokesman said, We are refurbishing our new port store car park. We'll have marshals on hand to minimise disruption for our customers while the work takes place, and we'll keep everyone updated on our progress. This is Den reading an article from the island Echo. Almost all visitors banned from St Mary's Hospital under latest restrictions. Only those nearing the end of their life, child inpatients and those giving birth will be allowed to receive visitors at St Mary's Hospital, the Isle of Wight NHS Trust has confirmed. Enhanced visiting restrictions are now in place across all inpatient wards at St Mary's Hospital. The decision to restrict visiting across the site is not one that the Trust has taken lightly, 
but due to the continuing rise in COVID-19 patients being treated at the hospital, it says it must put the safety of our patients and staff first. There are some exceptions to these restrictions where one family member is permitted to visit. These are a patient that is nearing end of life, a child who is an inpatient on the children's ward and a birthing partner to the labour ward. Visiting for the above exceptions should be agreed with the appropriate ward sister and proof of a negative lateral flow test will be expected. The hospital says that because it understands how important it is for the welfare of our patients to stay connected with friends and family whilst in hospital, it is continuing to offer its message to a loved one service. To use this service, send a message to the patient experience team at iownt.message hyphen two hyphen loved hyphen ones at nhs.net who will make sure your message receipt reaches them. If you are attending the hospital for an outpatient appointment, then you are reminded to attend alone unless in exceptional circumstances, in which case one carer is permitted. Friendly marshals remain at the front entrances to ensure the reason for your visit is valid and will request to see your appointment letter. On entry to hospital buildings, you are required to wear a face covering and continue to adhere to social distancing and use the hand sanitizer provided. If you arrive early, then you are asked to wait outside until it is time for your appointment. If you are exempt from wearing a face covering, then you are required to wear a face visor as an alternative. The Trust says, our visiting policy remains under continuous review. As soon as we feel it is safe to relax measures once more, we will look forward to welcoming visitors back to the hospital. In the meantime, we ask people for their understanding and support as we continue to take all necessary precautions to keep everybody safe. Hello, this is Sue reading an article from On The White. Housing plans rejected on grounds of underdevelopment. The vote was unanimous that plans better suited to the needs of the Isle of Wight would have been preferable. A four house scheme on the main road into Cowles has been rejected by the Isle of Wight Council's planning committee as councillors feared it was an underdevelopment of the site. Outline plans had been submitted by Alan and Ian Jones for four two-storey houses on Newport Road in Northwood. Previous proposals for the site called for five houses, but have been revised to four. Called in by Nicholson, Ward Councillor John Nicholson had called the application into the planning committee and said Northwood has had more than its fair share of housing and questions. Why was it necessary to add more? especially onto an unspoilt location and onto a busy arterial highway. Councillor Nicholson said if the development was approved, it would irreparably damage the greenfield and do nothing to benefit Northwood. Councillor Quirk build more in line with the island's need. Councillor Chris Kirk said he was not a fan of green development anywhere and wondered if there had been any consideration to building homes more in line with the island's need on the site instead of the four potentially three or four bed houses. He said it seemed to be under development of the site, but the houses proposed were prime for those retiring to the island and not much use for young islanders trying to set up home. Councillor Quirk suggested four buildings with four masonettes be built on the site instead, which would support local housing. Councillor Vanessa Churchman said, while it may not be a material planning consideration, it is unnecessary housing and they might as well build the house on the top of Culver Down. Under presumption in favour of sustainable development, planning team leader Russell Chick explained the need for housing across the island and how the council falls under the presumption in favour of sustainable development. He said while the proposed development was not in the settlement boundary, officers deem it sustainable and it was next to existing housing in the key regeneration area. In the island plan, Mr Chick said, housing is encouraged to be built in the key regeneration area. 
Councillor Quirk proposed rejection on the grounds of underdevelopment of the site, seconded by Councillor Jeff Brodie. Members of the planning committee eligible to vote unanimously voted to refuse planning permission. Officers have suggested permission to be granted with 15 conditions. This is Michael reading from Isle of Wight Radio. Wooden Bridge welcomes return of pop-up post office. Islanders who live in Wooden will no longer have to go to East Cowes, Pan or Binstead to access a post office, thanks to a new pop-up one. The service is after months of collaborative work between Wooden Bridge Parish Council and Community Action Isle of Wight. The pop-up office is situated in the former Brannan's Tea Room, adjacent to the Parish Council office. It can handle all services except for passports. It will initially operate for three hours a week, Wednesday mornings 9.30am to 12.30pm. Chairman of the Parish Council, Councillor Dahl Pitcher, said, I am pleased that post office counter services have returned to Wooden Bridge. The loss of our post office was a huge blow to the community and a hot topic during the May elections. Back then I promised to get services back and I am proud to say that working in partnership we have been able to do it. I would like to thank Community Action Isle of Wight for their support. McDonald's runs out of milkshakes and bottled drinks. McDonald's has run out of milkshakes and bottled drinks. The fast food chain is facing a national supply shortage, which is also affecting stores on the Isle of Wight in Newport and Ryde. McDonald's said that low stock distribution has affected the availability of milkshakes and bottled drinks, which are also out of stock at 1,250 outlets across England, Scotland and Wales. It's thought a lack of lorry drivers is to blame. A spokesperson for McDonald's said, Like most retailers, we are currently experiencing some supply chain issues, impacting the availability of a small number of products. Bottled drinks and milkshakes are temporarily unavailable in restaurants across England, Scotland and Wales. We apologise for any inconvenience and thank our customers for their continued patience. McDonald's is also axing garlic cheese bites, barbecue quarter pounders with cheese, both single and double sizes, Mac Spices, Twix McFlurries and Mars McFlurries. The six items were on the limited edition menu and today, Tuesday the 24th, is the last chance to bag them. This is Dan reading an article from On The White. Men only walk and talk session aimed to helping improve Isle of Wight's men's mental health. Men only is a peer-led initiative to support men and raise awareness of men's mental health issues. Men only are based in Ryde on the Isle of Wight. On Sunday, September the 5th, we will be holding our first ever men only walk and talk meeting. There has never been a better time to raise awareness around men's mental health and we are so grateful to all those who have chosen to support us in this initiative. Men only have a mission to support men, whether they need some advice or just the space to talk. We intend to create a peer group to help men prevent mental health problems proactively rather than reactively. We are inviting island men to join us for this, our first Sunday afternoon session. We are also making walking buddies available on the walk to ensure we create a non-judgmental environment and opportunity to share and offload, which is the purpose of the men only walk and talk sessions. We know how much easier it is for some men to open up when they are out and about. Peer led guidance will allow them to hear how other men in similar situations have worked their way through the darkness. We are confident that making the opportunity to share either by talking, listening or simply by experiencing their value will allow them to be themselves, share experiences and emotions without judgment and learn that it is okay not to be okay and it's okay to feel emotional. 
Men only provide to aid, aim to provide all men with the opportunity to make new friends. We will strive to end the social stigma of mental health and the experience, the loneliness many men experience. If you have any questions or require more information on how you can help, please write to Carl Hart, carl at menonlyiow.co.uk. To find out more, visit the Men Only website. You can also message Carl via WhatsApp on 077597296649 or visit the Men Only IOW Facebook group. Hello, this is Sue reading an article from On The White. I haven't seen him that happy in a long time, says mum of child with autism after riding sessions. This group of young people with autism have found that bonding with the horses and ponies has given them a new confidence. The Einstein Centre is a specialist centre for children on the autistic spectrum on the Isle of Wight and the children have been visiting, riding, grooming and bonding with our horses and ponies over the last few months with subsidised donations from White Horse CIC. The group have grown in confidence. Most were understandably nervous about meeting and riding the horses, but over the weeks their achievements have been growing. Sharing a wonderful bond, Rue Hirons, who has always wanted to horse ride, has met and fallen in love with Colin the Cobb. Both share blue eyes and a wonderful bond. Rue understands that he has to be calm when he visits the horses, as they can get frightened. And even though he finds this very hard, his behaviour and manners have calmed when he works with the horses. Haven't seen him that happy in a long time, his mum Helen says. He was so excited and exhilarated when he came home from his first session and I haven't seen him that happy in a long time. Made new friends with horses and people, Rue is now riding regularly and his confidence and calmness with the horses has grown. Rue adds... My biggest achievement is that I've made friends with horses and people. His mum has also seen his outlook change. Before coming here, Ruth's safe place was home and so he wouldn't leave the house. But now he's happy to come here, not once, but twice on some days and he even tells me to leave early to get there on time. Building confidence, another Einstein student, Izzy, was extremely anxious about coming somewhere new. The first few sessions saw her very quiet and worried, but as the weeks have gone on and she spent more time in the saddle and interacting with the horses, she's become a lot more confident. Working with horses provides a focus and a safe place where individuals can learn and grow and seeing achievements, no matter how large or small, is always special. This is Michael reading from Isle of Wight Radio. Isle of Wight e-scooter user charged with drink driving. An e-scooter driver on the Isle of Wight has been charged with drink driving. Hampshire Constabulary says it arrested a man on Shanklin Esplanade at 11.58pm on August the 21st. Jasper Firth, aged 18, of Cambridge Grove, Hammersmith, has been charged. Isle of Wight police said a male was arrested and charged for drink driving on a Beryl E scooter. He will attend court at a later date. I believe this is the fourth person now. I will be in contact with Beryl and the council to discuss what they can do to reduce the risk of harm to others and to prevent this from happening. He will appear before the courts on September the 10th. This is Petrina reading an article from Ireland Echo. New 21st century plaques on the island's Robert Hooke Trail. Robert Hooke, a 17th century contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton, Samuel Pepys and Sir Christopher Wren, was one of the world's greatest scientists as well as one of the architects rebuilding London after the Great Fire. He was born on the island in Freshwater and, although he left as a boy of 13, it strongly influenced his later scientific work. In 2010, a local paper reported the establishment of the Robert Hooke Trail by the Freshwater Parish Council, together with the Robert Hooke Society in Freshwater. 
It is a picturesque eight mile circular walk in the West White via Fort Victoria, Yarmouth, Freshwater Bay and Golden Hill Fort. After 10 years, the posts supporting these plaques had begun to rot. On the 19th and 20th of August 2021, the Freshwater Parish Council and the Robert Hooke Society removed all the original plaques and replaced them with 12 colourful vitreous enamel information plaques around the route. These were manufactured by an island company, A.J. Wells, and designed with the help of another island company, Pepper Creative. Each plaque describes some aspects of Hook's career and show the relationship to his boyhood on the island. The new designs are very modern, incorporating information and pictures on different facets of Hook's discoveries and inventions. They also have a map of the trail, plus QR and what three-word codes, both providing route maps to indicate directions and plaque locations. Free applications for these code, readers are available to download on the World Wide Web. The new trail signs will be an interesting and colourful contribution to the tourism of the island. This is Dan reading an article from On the White. £100,000 funding boost for Creative Biosphere Project. The Isle of Wight area of outstanding natural beauty, island collection and the Isle of Wight Cultural Education Partnership have been awarded an Arts Council grant of £100,000 for their Creative Biosphere project. This is a one-year project starting in the new academic year, bringing together the objectives of the Cultural Education Partnership and Isle of Wight UNESCO Biosphere Reserve by the coming together of arts, heritage and environmental organisations with secondary schools to remove the barriers that currently prevent children and young people from participating in creative activities. Currently, children and young people on the Isle of Wight have limited access to cultural facilities and experiences due to geographical isolation and cost of travel to mainland, leading to endemic low aspirations and lack of social mobility. The project will involve schools, which include communities of Ryde, Ventnor West and Newport, by embedding five creative practitioners in each of the schools, acting as bridges to help build down language barriers that exist between the different sectors, so that schools and creative partners can better meet students' needs. The role of cultural organisations is to provide support and knowledge to commissioned artists and working with schools to develop a deeper understanding of how to connect with their CYP for future projects. Arts Council England said, the IWA ONB has presented a very strong idea with very clearly expressed aims and clearly demonstrating how these aims will fulfil our Let's Create strategy and wider aims of Arts Council England. Richard Grogan, lead officer for the IWAONB, said, We are grateful for the Arts Council England for this grant, which we will bring the arts and environmental sectors together for the benefit of children and young people and lead to greater appreciation of the, the IW Biosphere Reserve. Chris Slan, chair of Isle of Wight Cultural Education Partnership, said, this is a fantastic project that will significantly strengthen the island's cultural education partnership. We look forward to working with all the AONB, creative partners, schools and local artists to ensure that our UNESCO biosphere designation is better understood and creatively interpreted in both learning and community settings. This is Michael reading from Ireland Echo. Attempts to spark large bonfire on Benbridge Beach thwarted by emergency services and environmental concerns sparked a multi-agency response to a beach in Benbridge yesterday evening, Tuesday the 24th. Officers from Hampshire Constabulary attended the scene at Point Beach at around 1700 
after receiving reports of members of the public constructing a bonfire with what appeared to be waste wood. One eyewitness told Island Echo that around 10 car loads of wood had been deposited on the beach throughout the afternoon. Bembridge Coast Guard Rescue Team was tasked to assist the police due to the location of the pyre with an appliance from the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service also attended to provide cover in the event that the fire was lit. A duty counter pollution officer and environmental health specialist were also contacted. Eventually the pyre was reportedly deconstructed. An HM Coast Guard spokesperson said burning of unlicensed waste on our beaches will be challenged and enforcement used if necessary. Elsewhere in the evening reports of yet more people attempting to walk to St Helens Fort at low tide prompted Coast Guards to give words of advice. This is Petrina reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Isle of Wight Road races still yet to apply for permission for 2022 event. Permission for the time trial races in the southwest of the island to take place next April have not yet been granted. The permits from the Isle of Wight Council as Highways Authority and the Auto Cycle Union, ACU, have not been applied for yet. Promoters told a meeting at Chael Parish Council last night, Monday. Tim Addison, representing the Isle of Wight Road Races, IWRR, said they have been in detailed talks with the ACU for months and are working towards a recommendation from the Council's Safety Advisory Group, SAG SAG, on a scheduled time frame. Mr Anderson said it was hoped that the SAG would make its recommendations by the autumn. The council, acting as highways authority, will determine whether a motor race order can be issued for the time trials to take place on public roads, but the promoter must first obtain a permit issued by the ACU. Councillor John Harrison from Shurwell Parish Council queried whether there would be enough time for the permit submissions and necessary six-month consultations to take place before the event. Mr Addison said planning had been underway for some time, but they were nowhere near any deadline. The motor race order deadline is on October the 20th, but the ACU permission must be in place before then. Islander James Kay, another event promoter and champion motor racer, said the SAG would determine whether the event was safe, not just for the residents living near the racetrack, but all those on the island and those coming for the event. If it was not, the time trials would not go ahead. Mr K reassured residents that they were doing the utmost to ensure safety was the number one priority. Addressing concerns about the potential impact of COVID, with the island facing a sudden influx of cases. Mr Addison said they had paused aspects of the event while they waited for restrictions to be lifted, but now they had it was an opportunity to start working. He said, you cannot fear everything being closed down again. Mr Kay said the roadworks proposed before the race, including anti-slip painting, replacing manhole covers, and temporary removal of road signs may impact residents a small amount. IWRR are holding a six weeks consultation which started on August the 1st to hear thoughts from residents and address issues. Mr Addison said, We are very keen to welcome people into the conversation who know what they are talking about and not just deal with speculation and the hyperbole about it. This is Dan reading an article from the Island Echo. Council releases guidance to parents following school cyber hack. Isle of Wight schools affected by the recent ransomware attack are now undertaking a data collection exercise. This process would usually happen at the start of term to ensure the data they hold on file is up to date and ready for the start of the autumn term. Following the cyber attack last month, 
Access to all of the school's recorded information has been frozen. Some data has been provided back to the school by the local authority in line with data sharing agreements in place. This includes earlier collected contact information for parents or carers of pupils. As email addresses for the schools have been suspended, parents who do not receive contact due to, cha due to changes in circumstances since earlier contact information was collected are asked to get in touch with their school using the following email addresses to request a data co collection form. Honey Hill Primary School through Class Dojo Lanes End Primary School caroline.sice at lanesendpriow.iow.sch.uk or carry.armand at lanesendpri.p dot iow dot sch dot uk barton office at barton pri dot iow dot sch dot uk isle of wight education federation the iwef please email any inquiries about the incident to data at iwef Dot org dot uk. For all other school inquiries, please use carisbrook at iwef.org.uk or m medina at iwed.org.uk or viform at iwef.org.uk. The incident has been reported to the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO and we are working closely with them to resolve any data protection issues arising. The council continues to work with the schools, police, and a cyber security firm that specializes in this sort of attack to investigate what might be done to retrieve the lost data. The schools involved are focused on ensuring the start of term runs as smoothly as possible and are working tirelessly to this end. The schools are grateful for the patients, support and involvement of parents, carers and students in helping them to rebuild their systems ready for September. Digital health tips for parents and students. Everyone can improve their cyber security by taking these simple actions. Use a strong password. Create passwords using three random words. Turn on two-factor authentication, update your devices, and back up your data. More information can be found on the National Cyber Security Centre website. Hello, this is Sue reading an article from On the White. Isle of Wight Care Home being forced to close. Council step in to protect residents. The national body that inspects care homes was so concerned that residents were being put at risk it cancelled the home's registration, forcing it to close. The Isle of Wight Council is working hard to ensure the residents of a care home that is being closed by the Care Quality Commission, the CQC, remain safe and well cared for. New placements for all 16 residents of the privately run care home, Furbank Residential Care Home, 11 of whom are funded by the Council, are being arranged by council staff working closely with them, their families and the CQC. Judged as inadequate, its most recent inspection in June 2021 identified a range of serious problems which were putting residents at risk, leading to the home being judged inadequate. It had previously been rated good in 2017. Following their recent inspection, the CQC has subsequently decided to serve notice to cancel the home's registration, which will result in its closure at the end of a 28-day period. The care home will no longer be able to deliver care and support from the 4th of September 2021. A review of each and every resident's needs has been undertaken. Laura Gordian, the Council's Interim Director of Adult Social Care and Housing Needs, said the Council 
had acted swiftly as soon as it became aware of the issues contacting all residents and their families directly to offer support, including those who fund their own care. She said, the safety and well-being of the frail and elderly residents of the care home is our top priority. This is a very distressing and worrying time for both the residents and their families, and our priority has been to support them as best we can. As soon as the CQC notified the council of their significant concerns and intentions to close the care home, in order to ensure that the residents were safe and well cared for, council staff were immediately redeployed to provide round-the-clock care and support to residents. A review of each and every resident's needs has been undertaken by the council social work team, involving their families and advocates as necessary. As a result, Alternative care has already been identified for residents. Eight have either already moved or are moving over the next few days. Having identified the care and support needs for the remaining residents, the council is working with local providers and families to ensure everyone has somewhere safe and capable of meeting their individual needs before the CQC closure deadline. Frail elderly people should be nurtured in their golden years, council or car love. Cabinet member for adult social care added, it is the immediate welfare and safety of the residents that is our foremost priority. These are frail people who should be nurtured in their golden years and provided with the quality of care we would all want for a loved one. We have been working calmly and carefully with our health and care partners to ensure we support both the residents and their families at this upsetting time for them all. I want to thank all those who responded so quickly to support our island residents. Our island carers have worked so very hard during this epidemic and there are many accounts of them going the extra mile and I truly appreciate all their and other frontline workers' efforts. This is Michael reading an article from Island Echo. New Century Park for God's Hill thanks to extra boost from Southern Vectis. Residents in God's Hill are set to benefit from a new sensory park thanks to the efforts of volunteers and an extra boost from Southern Vectist. Next to the Village Hall and God's Hill inclusive play park, the new resource is expected to be used by people of all ages from across the community. The garden has been chosen as one of the recipients of the Isle of Wight Bus Operators Community Fund which was reinstated in May. The community fund is open to applicants twice a year, during May and November, where Southern Vectors will fund or support good causes. Southern Vectors General Manager Richard Tidsley says, we introduced the Southern Vectors Community Fund to help support all manner of local good causes, from charities to sports teams, and we encouraged anyone who needs a helping hand, however big or small, to apply. God's Hill Century Garden will offer local people a wonderful opportunity to connect with nature and find peace and quiet. We are delighted to be donating £250 to such a worthy cause. Fran Shelley, a volunteer fundraiser for God's Hill Inclusive Play Park, and God's Hill Village Hall added, We really appreciate the help Southern Vectis has given us. The donation will be used to create an environment that provides enrichment to a number of local people. Already, the area is visited by many, including those with disabilities, parents with children and dog walkers. So this new sensory garden will make tremendous difference to the local community. Some of our local residents have already volunteered to come and work in the garden, planting shrubs and creating what promises to be a beautiful space here next to the village hall. We'll make very good use of the extra funds from Southern Vectis and we're all looking forward to completing the garden as soon as we can. This is Petrina reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. War graves on Isle of Wight to be tidied thanks to Royal Marines Association. Royal Marines Association. War graves across the Isle of Wight will be tidied up thanks to the Royal Marines Association on the Isle of Wight. It's part of a tidy up war graves campaign 
which will run for 75 days and see 458 graves in 45 cemeteries across the island tidied up. Nine of them are Royal Marines. The scheme will mark the 75th anniversary of the Royal Marine Association part of the Royal Marines charity. School children on the Isle of Wight are also being encouraged to produce one flower each to be displayed at Shanklin Chine on Remembrance Day. The campaign starts on September the 1st and will finish on Remembrance Sunday. Royal Marines Association branch secretary Terry Goodwin said, This is quite an ambitious project. It will require a lot of work over a long period of time. The work has to be carried out in a quiet and dignified way. More detail is shown below. There are a number of ways we can get this job done. We will depend on the amount of work required at each war grave. We can do it individually or in small groups. So once we know the scale of the work required, we can decide on each individual case. Hello, this is Francis reading part of the talking news. And this is Lester. Right, before we start the second part of the county press, here is this week's society news. Right, Um, coffee and chat is on every Wednesday from 10am until 11.30 and it is only £1 to include the cake and coffee. Come along and spend time with members and staff. Discussions, discussing various topics, etc. And the Thursday Mix and Mingle is held every week starting at 10.30 and finishing at 2pm. If you'd like to come along, please call the office to book a space. Transport can be arranged if required. A quiz has been organised by our fantastic volunteer Jan for everyone to enjoy. And the new swimming group will start on the 6th of September at Medina Leisure Centre between 1.30 and 2.30pm. Transport for this can be arranged. The cost is £5 plus £2.50 for transport. Please call the office to put your name down if you're interested. Members have already shown an interest. The office will contact you to confirm details during the week. The new lunch club on Tuesday, September the 14th at the Hotel Rye Castle. If you would like to come, please call the office and book a space. Menus are now available and orders are required by Thursday the 10th of September. Reminder about the open day on the 11th of September at Millbrook House between 10.30 and 3.30. If you are interested in coming, please call the office so we can cater for numbers. For more details, please do not hesitate to call the office or to book your place your space, please call Susan on 5-222-05. And we move on to letters to the editor. Stop parking on Compton Verges, and this is from Celia Vosper in Freshwater. In the light of, but not necessarily connected with, the weekend's bad accident at Hanover Point Military Road, surely the time is well overdue to try and sort out the access and verge parking around the car park area for Compton Beach. Every summer, car park in, cars park indiscriminately all over the verges and the occupants spill onto the road in their haste to get to the beach. This also causes problems with the vehicles leaving the car park as the vision is badly restricted. Maybe a reduced speed limit for that area would help as it is around the Bryston Bay area of the same road. Meters great from Heather and Will (coughs) Welch, Somerset. Having just read the letter from a holiday maker who had problems with parking, county press letters, 13th of August, We totally disagree with their comments. Mm. We have just returned from two weeks holiday on your beautiful island. My sister installed the app on her phone and we used it without any problem. It is particularly useful if you want to extend your parking time 
No need to go back to the car, just tap in the extra time required. This is from Christine and Graham Robinson, who live in Bryston. Road races team's tone is offensive and not helpful. It is reported, County Press Online 230821, that Mr Addison of the road races is keen to welcome people into the conversation who know what they are talking about and not just deal with the speculation and hyperbole. We would submit that people directly affected do know what they are talking about regarding the disruption of their lives. We would also submit that they themselves can only speculate about the event and its effect on the island, albeit with some knowledge gained from the Isle of Man. We find the tone being adopted exceedingly ins insulting and not conducive to constructive discussion. This was apparent in the leaflet supplied at the information saying that it was not a consultation and not to be offensive. Amazing people, Karen Munns, Gunville. On June the 12th, my husband suffered a stroke and was airlifted to Southampton with great speed immediately after being diagnosed in St Mary's A&E unit. He spent eight days there before returning to St Mary's Hospital where he remained under such great care until his passing in the early morning of August the 21st. I wish to thank the A&E department at St Mary's, the air crew and all the staff at the stroke unit in Southampton. Also, special thanks to all the staff on the stroke unit at St Mary's who tended him for 49 days there before he finally ended up on the wonderful Wellow Ward for his final 13 days. They were a beyond amazing. Thanks to Sarah and Martin, who have been so kind in taking me to visit, into appointments, and spending many out long hours sitting with me in the hospital. As I'm alone now, they were a great comfort and I appreciate it. Wellow Ward staff were simply amazing and my husband couldn't have dreamed of better care to the very end. We are so lucky on this island to have such wonderful caring people when we most need them and none of us ever knows when that might be. So again, thanks to everyone I've mentioned and to those I may have omitted. And this is from Mrs J Jordan who lives in Ryde. Ride Town Council should fight threat to toilets. What are Ride Town Council doing in support of residents when the pretty gardens and well-used public toilets at the Western Gardens are under threat? Why has RTC failed to even respond to the Isle of Wight Council's consultation on behalf of Ride residents to save our well-used facilities to make space for more roads and cars. Not only have they remained silent, they have failed to prepare any public meeting on the proposals to help inform and support us in responding effectively before the consultation closed. The continuous hike upwards in precept money helps keep these toilets maintained to a good standard and I want RTC openly to support retaining the existing facilities because currently no plan by the train company exists to provide any toilets in the closed rail station. Yet this decision is being made by the Isle of Wight Council on September the 9th at County Hall at 5pm. Please join us to emphasise that the removal of our public toilets is a backward step and disproportionately affects people with ill health and or disability. The elderly, women, outdoor workers and the homeless. Tunnel Vision, Cliff Bennett, Cranmar. No, Mr Toller, I haven't missed the point at all. Of course the ferries are run for profit as are all businesses. My comparison of profits was simply to underline that, in the overall scheme of things, the profits made by White Light, Link and Red Funnel are insignificant. Nine out of ten complaints are because a one-off booking 
couldn't be made on a specific occasion. I have made thousands of journeys over the last 40 years using all the ferry services, including the hovercraft, and I would say that only around 5% have been adjusted. As with others, Mr Toller makes the digging of a tunnel sound so simple. A bit of a slope on either side and then the bit in between. It is built by private tender, will cost £30 per crossing for 20 years and then be owned by the Isle of Wight Council. Presumably this fee will not be subject to inflation. How do you arrive at this figure, Mr Toller? I assume you have an ology in tunnel building. I wonder how Mr Toller would feel if a CPO were to drop on his doormat commandeering his property because the exit was coming out in his back garden. For the record, all the supermarkets operate a price maintenance system for their own branded goods anywhere in the UK apart from Northern Ireland. Protect Our Seas from Johnny Reynolds in Newport. I am writing to bring awareness to the effects of harmful fishing practices, raising awareness in the hope of getting Isle of Wight MP Bob Seeley to take action. I'm an island resident, an earth scientist and oceano oceanographer, and am currently training in the education sector. It's crucial for sustainable food stocks, environmental protection, and real economic growth that we protect our oceans and sea resources and harmful fishing practices particularly those in protected areas are called out and challenged in parliament one example recently was a trawler catching vast amounts in a marine protected area the island is one place where tourism and fishing industry could be a large part of economy and both of these require protection of our coasts and seas. This should also be seen as part of a wider picture to transition to sustainable green development rather than economic stagnation, which will be hugely beneficial for local people that have unfairly been hit so hard in the last 50 years. I therefore suggest local MPs listen to these issues and challenge the government to do the right thing rather than talk about it and wait for the issue to go away. Looking for my long lost friend, John Lewis, Newport. I have lost the name of the friend who sailed with me from Saundersfoot Harbour in Pembrokeshire to Cowes. I was about 20 in the late 1950s and an engineer apprentice at Saunders Row. I wanted to move our offspray boat from Saundersfoot. My friend was also at Saunders Row and may have been a member of the East Cows Sailing Club. We went from Southampton to Saundersfoot by train. My mum drove us to the harbour to get the boat ready. The next day we pushed the boat into the water and sailed away. We headed for Cornwall. We had planned to stop at Lundy Island. As we got near our progress was excellent so we sailed on for Cornwall. At Padstow we pulled the boat up on the beach. I don't remember if we slept on the beach or went to a B&B. &B. We must have had breakfast somewhere before sailing around Land's End and up the English Channel to the Needles and on to Cowes. At the boat park was a huge flying boat and we parked our boat under a wing. If you know who it was, please get in touch with me on 07817-736-909. A letter from John M. McGee, Ride, Homing Cans, question mark. Is there a new scam which is being perpetrated on unwitting innocent island population? I have come to the ineluctable conclusion that significant numbers of islanders, not principally visitors, are being sold goods made of metal or glass or plastic, in the main, under false pretenses. 
The good folk of the island are clearly purchasing significant numbers of receptacles which they firmly believe to be homing cans or self-destructing bottles. What else can explain the increasing number of these receptacles which I see not thrown away but carefully placed at street corners or on walls in order that they can use the fabulous new technology which will allow them to find their own way to then into in uh, their own way into a bin. I can reveal to those duped citizens that the bottles, tins, etc. are definitely not capable either of locating the nearest bin or of launching themselves into a bin, no matter how close they are to one. Until such self-binning technology be perfected, I urge those purchasers to cut out the middleman and instead themselves help the bottles, tins, etc. into a bin on the street or even in extremis at home. We now move on to white memories. When stars shone at the winter gardens. People of a certain age will remember 50 Saturday nights at Ventnor Winter, Gar winter Gardens. Up to a thousand people would arrive at the cliff top dance hall, many by coaches from across the island. Those lucky enough would travel by car and taxis. It was the haunt of footballers who headed for the venue after their matches. Many weren't great dancers, but most of them had the instant chat-up lines for ladies who were looking for partners. Many romances started in that steamy ballroom. The Winter Gardens was built on the site of the former Ventler Parsonage. The original building was demolished in 1935 and the Art Deco building, as we know it today, opened in 1936. It was inspired by the design of the De La War Pavilion in Bexhill, Sussex. In 1936, the Bright Times Concert Party was transferred from the nearby Town Hall, which later became a popular venue for summer repertory companies. Rumours suggest the Winter Garden's first nighters saw the show and were daubed with, new, daubed with new paint that hadn't dried. Up until the Second World War, the venue welcomed summer season shows, visiting orchestras, famous big bands, star celebrity concerts and talent nights. The 1950 resident summer season show was called Ventnor Vanities and starred a very young Dick Emery. The county press advertised it as the gayest show on the island. How times have changed. The Ventnor Winter Garden certainly became a part of the swinging 60s and some popular stars of the era came to perform. These included The Who, Brian Poole and the Tremolos, Screaming Lord Such, Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers, The Pretty Things and Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. Some of these were promoted by Radio Caroline. One of the support bands who appeared on a few occasions was Davy Jones and the Lower Third. He quickly changed his name to David David Bowie. I once met an island lady who got to know him very well. When the Tempest Seven arrived at, at the peak of their fame, all box office records must have been smashed. The machine counting the numbers was obviously a little faulty that night. Lots of local bands were popular at the gardens, particularly when the island's top group, the Cherokees, moved their popular 69 club there for a while. The Knights and Zodiacs had regular spots and the Ventnor-based Shamrocks, who went on to German success and, rec and a recording contract that produced an album, made many appearances there, as did local rock and roll singer Johnny Vincent. Cowsborn singer Pat Reader, who recorded the legendary Joe Meek, was also a resident singer. When wrestling became all the rage, there were some entertaining evenings in the Winter Gardens, and crowds flocked to see the top names. There are some unprintable stories about a few of the guys who came to fight. 
In the mid-1980s, they tried a series of cabaret shows starring some light entertainment stars of the day. The Bachelors were by far the most successful and sold out three nights in a row. Others who came included Helen Shapiro, Eve Boswell and Roger Kitter. When Colin Crompton and Don Estelle came, the night proved a disaster. It was not their fault, they were both in fine form, but on the very same evening, Danny LaRue was playing to 2,000 people a few miles up the bay at Sandown Pavilion. You never knew who might turn up at the Winter Gardens. There was great excitement in 1980 when the legendary David Bellamy came for one night. During our interview, he revealed the Torrey Canyon marine disaster turned him into a television star. He was the only scientist currently working on the pollution of the sea and had to appear in the news bulletins. Trad jazz was always so popular over the years and the three giants of the industry, Acker Bilk, Chris Barber and Kenny Ball, were regular visitors. I can still vividly remember the Barber band when they had Kenneth Washington a guest jazz, jazz and rhythm and blues singer from America. He was sensational. They continued to present variety shows and the Felix Bowness giveaway show was always a hit. <clears throat> the punters lapped up his insults. He had earlier found fame as Fred Quilly, the jockey in Heidi High. They also produced a series of professional repertory plays when the town hall closed. For some years, the venue was a multi-purpose unit. It was used for badminton, dance classes, exhibitions, festivals, and by the Ventnor Film Society. Its links with the past were also revived with the visits of pop stars such as The Christians, Midge Ear, Belinda Carlisle, and UB40. They also welcomed the Antiques Roadshow with Michael Aspel, and an edition of Radio 4's Any Questions. When I ran the County Press Theatre Awards for 17 years, I saw some brilliant local amateur productions at the venue. Some were worthy award winners. By far the most outstanding show I saw was the Ventnor Theatre Group's superb production of Buddy. It brought tears to my eyes and was better than some professional productions I had seen of the musical. Their younger members also performed a stunning version of Les Miserables. Sadly, in a way, the Winter Gardens has always been somewhat in the shadow of the nearby Shanklin Theatre and Sandown Pavilion. Ironically, it has outlived the Sandown Pavilion. Long may it continue to flourish. My view, let's challenge government on housing targets by Bob Seeley, MP for the Isle of Wight. Since the first draft island plan was published in 2019, thousands of islanders have raised concerns about housing targets. The new island plan is an opportunity to do things better. I welcome the plan to build in existing settlements, preserve more countryside and deliver better infrastructure. I thank the council staff for their important work on this plan. However, the more we can do to improve the plan that will give greater protection to our landscape while helping young islanders find homes. The new target is still too large and calculated using a flawed methodology. It demands more new homes per year than have been built in any year since 2010. Health care, road, sewerage and electricity are all under growing pressure. I have seen no local support for an increase in the rate of development. Just 28% of the target will be affordable. The target does not primarily support islanders and I am concerned it is setting the island up to fail. 
I believe a more sustainable future is possible. I am again calling for the Council to seek exceptional circumstances and challenge our government set housing need. I want to see us level up across the island, building efficiently and sensitively in existing communities and bringing families back to town centres. We already have over 2,000 unbuilt permissions. One in 20 homes are out of use. We need to value the island's beautiful landscape and natural character. That means designating and protecting undeveloped spaces. We need a much lower proportion of greenfield development. Currently, 70% of new development is on greenfield land. That makes those properties car dependent and almost always too large and expensive for islanders and especially young islanders. These are not built for the benefit of the island, but developers and landowners trying to cash in when they can. I want the island to have more landscape protection and for the island to become an island park. I will develop this idea in the coming months. We need to champion beautiful design. We need a local model design code, which I am calling for the council to help develop. The island plan is a vital document that will help shape, shape the island for the next 15 years. We need to get it right. This is the beginning of the debate, not the end. I urge you to let the council know your thoughts. And this column, my view, is written by Catherine James. And the headline is, Hands, Face and Private Place, a Modern Mantra. And there's a picture of the flooded paddling pool at Ventnor es Esplanade. They say that the island is England in miniature, and within this tiny territory is nested an even smaller Isle of Wight. The paddling pool at Ventnor Esplanade has delighted generations of scrabbling wet-footed children. However, earlier this month, barefoot nippers would have been knee-deep as the island experienced what the newspapers pithily headlined deluge. By the middle of August, the county had already had 147% of the average summer rainfall. This double wipers weather caused mayhem for drivers by cracking roads and lifting manhole covers. Though it will have pleased gardeners among you, water butts are bubbling over with joy. But while fires rage uncontrolled across the world and mainland of Europe, experiences recording record-breaking temperatures, we, we can't be too smug about our soggy summer. Old gubbers among you will remember the drought of the long hot summer of 76. My friends and I played in dry and dusty roads under the searing sun. Hose pipe use was forbidden as reservoirs dried and the arid ground crazed. In that desiccated year, we school children were taught about the preciousness of water. Clean your teeth without the tap running. Recite the toilet mantra as if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Bath night was Sunday and in my weekly ablutions, I'd flannel away rings of dust around my ankles, neck and wrists. With water bowsers appearing in some streets, the daily personal hygiene diktat in my household became what my mother alliteratively referred to as face, fanny and feet, and this still holds true. This may come as a shock to the twice-a-day showerers among you, but it is just detergent and cosmetic manufacturers muck-shaming us into wasting water ourselves and our clothes excessively. I felt somewhat vindicated in my long-established water-conserving attitude to washing when Hollywood power couple Ashton Kutcher and Myla Kunis recently revealed 
that they too have a relaxed approach to bathing personally, not having an all over wash very often and only cleaning their children <coughs> when you can see the dirt on them. Otherwise, there's no point. I could almost see my mother nodding with approval when I read Myla I read that Myla cleans pits and tits and holes and soles every day, but that's it. This is nothing new. Queen Elizabeth had a bath only once a month, apparently, whether she needed it or no. I call my wash a cat's lick, which is one up from the Roxhall shower. Other districts in, in Sarts are available, <coughs> excuse me, but it's basically spraying armpits with deodorant. The floodwaters have subsided and Ventnor paddling pool is no longer a metaphor for sea level rise. But as the planet continues to heat, water will be the most precious resource. Temperature climbs like ours will be even more desirable places to live as humans migrate from increasingly inhospitable lands. As well as being England in min miniature, they also say that the world's population can fit on the Isle of Wight. And if they do, will they want to share the bath water? What's on? Jay Miller's circus had children wrapped. Out of the mouths of babes and innocents, you get a real view of how good a circus is. Charlotte Marriott took her two children, Zach Marriott Gordon, three, and Isabel Marriott Gordon, six, to Jay Miller's show at the race course this week and enjoyed every minute. Charlotte said, I know how easily distracted my children are, but they sat wrapped through the whole thing. The family enjoyed the full circus experience from having their faces painted by Peppy the Clown to clapping along with the music. Mum Charlotte loved Matty's dangerous Aerial Skywalk, Aerial Skywalk, with no protection from falls. Isabel, herself a budding gymnast, liked Talia Clare on the high trapeze and the dancing skills of Miss Jodie on the silver thread. But for young Zach, Peppy, cheeky clown, was the big hit. He was so naughty and wouldn't do what he was told, said Zach. J. Miller's Circus is at the race course roundabout until Tuesday. Also see acts such as bicycle duo Macagui from Spain and the show's youngest performer, JJ, the amazing juggler. Cows resident Mike Christie shot to fame as a member of G4 on the very first series of ITV's The X Factor. And now you can join him for a fly on the wall experience as he broadcasts his show from Ventnor Arts Club. The Mike Must Go On will be broadcast live on Wednesday. Enjoy an evening of well-known classics, including West End Hits, Elton John, Ed Sheeran, Rodgers and Hammerstein, and many more, as Mike sings from the piano and showcases the diversity of his voice. He also performs his own self-penned songs. Due to the devastation of to the arts and entertainment industry during COVID, Mike has been performing live shows every Wednesday at home from his piano since May last year, racking up more than 130 shows and has sung 1,000 plus songs online. With hugely ranging themes each week, from Rabba, Abba, from Abba to Les Mis and Irish bands to opera, he even performed online panto last Christmas. Mike is also the founder of White Proms. Lucid aiming for par excellence at Browns. A great August Bank Holiday Monday tradition of recent years has been Lucid's gig in the park this year it may be a different venue, but the band is hoping for a similar vibe in the iconic surroundings of Brown's Golf Course on Sandown Seafront. Having been denied the chance to play last year, Lucid are happy to be back, having moved the bank holiday show from Rilston Garden Shanklin to the Sandown site. Lucid's core four-piece, 
of Blue and Sunny Brown, Nick Potts and Ollie Ducey are joined by Rob Berry on drums and Paul Ruck on electric guitar. The bands say the audience can expect the usual mix of covers and original material in a two-hour set from 3pm. Ollie said, over the past 12 years, Lucid have used the stunning Realston Gardens. Unfortunately, this year, logistics mean this wasn't a viable option. However, the new venue looks set to trump years gone by, with a huge, spacious area located on the seafront. As usual, Lucid will be joined by guest musicians on stage between playing a plethora of original and cover material in their unique and stylish way. It's a free event, with a retiring collection to cover the overheads and profits being donated to Mountbatten on the island. Lucid lovers are asked to bring a chair with blanket and refreshments and there will be food and drink served at Brown's too. Sonny said, as an aspiring golfer when I was younger, I love Brown's and it's fantastic to be playing in a place that brings back great memories. I just hope our performance is on par. And this is what's on at Champlain Theatre. First event is August and the rest are September. On Sunday the 29th of August at 5pm, Quadrophenia, and this is um, pre uh, presented by the Goldhawks. Then on Friday the 3rd at 7.30pm, Lucy Worsley. And on Friday the 10th at 7.30pm, Hello Again. Tuesday the 21st, 7.30pm, Albert Lee. And Thursdays, and this is 2nd, 9th, 16th, 23rd and 1st, 30th, at all at 8, 15 p.m., Beyond the West End. And on Sunday the 5th at 7.30 p.m., Bacharach, back to Bacharach. On Sunday the 12th at 3 p.m., there's David Harper. And on Sunday the 26th at 7.30 p.m., there's Don, John Suchet. So if you're interested in any, any of those, the box office number is 01983 868 And you can book online at www.shanklintheatre, that's all squashed together in lowercase.com. Buskers at Newport Market. Buskers are coming to Newport Saturday Markets. Market Day CIC has created an outdoor music vibe alongside the Saturday Market in St Thomas's Square with regular free performances from the island's musical talent. A new group on social media has been set up under the Island Buskers Collective on Instagram and the Island Busking Collective on Facebook. Market Day's CIC's aim it is to kickstart cultural regeneration and bring performance, spectacle and entertainment to the county town. And uh, this weekend it's a 60th Cows to Torquay race. And uh, it's got a picture of a, a boat with named Dry Marqui Marqui Martini and Dry Martini will be one to watch, it says. Powerboat racing. There will be plenty of action on the Solent over the bank holiday weekend as the island plays host to the 60th anniversary of the world-renowned Cows Torquay Cows Powerboat Race. Competitors from as far afield as the United States and Italy will feature in Sunday's racing, which will also include the traditional Cows Pool Cows, a race that has seen the island's Frankie Rose, Frankie Rose enjoy success in recent years. Among the Cows Torquay starters will be island powerboat favourite Dry Martini, piloted by islander Christian Toll, one of the event's organisers. Racing teams will be competing in the second round of the UK OPRA Offshore Championship for the famous Beaverbrook Trophy. 
The 200 mile Cows Torquay race has long been recognised as one of the power boating's toughest challenges. The boats will be tested tomorrow, that's Saturday, between 2 pm and 3.30 pm, with Sunday's main race starting from the Royal Yacht Squadron line at 10 am, followed by the Cows Pool race at 10.15 am. The Cows Pool boats will reappear on the Solent to the finish line off Egypt Point from 11 a.m. Depending on conditions, the fastest Cows Torquay boats should start to appear on the Western Solent from noon onwards. Additional news items. A large fight in Ryde. A large scale fight broke out on Union Street in Ryde in the early hours of Saturday. Two, two people were left with injuries, police said, and an investigation is underway. A police spokesperson said, we were called at 2.07 a.m. on Saturday to reports of an altercation involving up to 15 people on Union Street. A 30-year-old woman suffered facial injuries and a 30-year-old man suffered an injury to his ear. Freemasons donate. Hundreds of blind and partially sighted children will be able to equally access the visual world of pictures, books and learning thanks to a grant of £30,000 from Hampshire and the Isle Wight Freemasons to the Living Paintings charity. Aggressive passenger and motorhome breakdown blamed for delays. East Cows was in gridlock on Saturday afternoon after Red Funnel announced another delay to its cross-solent service. The traffic, which had snaked its way from the car ferry terminal up to at least the top of York Avenue, was caused by a delay of around 30 minutes to one of the ferry firm's crossings between East Cows and Southampton. In a statement issued by Red Funnel, they said they had been working hard to deal with two incidents which contributed to the delays its customers experienced. Firstly, the team mobilised to clear a broken down motorhome. Secondly, our security team were unfortunately required to assist with an uh, aggressive passenger. Both these incidents had to be dealt with prior to sailing, a Red Funnel spokesman said. The delay caused by these two incidents, combined with high traffic volumes, caused congestion, which peaked at around 20 minutes prior to departure. We communicated with our customers to minimise delay. And uh, two items in brief here. Firstly, tractor accident. A man was rescued after trapping his arm underneath a tractor in Alverston on Tuesday. The incident happened on K Kern Lane and was attended by the Isle of Wight Ambulance Service, who sent three vehicles, the Kent, Surrey and Sussex Air Ambulance. The casualty was flown to Southampton General Hospital. Fire crews from Ryde and Shanklin also attended. And Sunday tea stop. Sunday afternoon teas have returned to Holy Cross Church, Binstead. With homemade cakes and teas and coffee, the church will offer a stop-off for those walking or cycling around the island coastal path or out for a Sunday to stroll. The church at the end of Church Road is offering the, the teas on Sundays, August the 29th, September the 12th and October the 3rd, which is Harvest Festival. And these are between 2 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Course provides taster of hospitality career. Quick fire courses have been set up at the Isle of Wight College to help get young people into the hospitality industry. The intensive training is seen as one way to solve the staffing crisis that has beset the industry since the COVID pandemic and Brexit changes meant many people left hospitality to work elsewhere. The shortfall in staff has led to a lack of chefs and experienced workers for kitchens across the island. 
Many venues have had to reduce their offerings and their opening hours due to lack of staff. It led Inns of Distinction, which has four pubs, to launch a charter to entice people into the industry and call out for solutions to get people interested in working in pubs, restaurants and hotels. Now a task force has been set up to get people trained at ground roots level. An Isle of Wight College spokesperson said, due to staff shortages in the hospitality sector, the Isle of Wight Council is working with Visit Isle of Wight, the Isle of Wight College and Ireland employers to run short training courses in hospitality skills. The courses supported people who would like to work in the hospitality sector but need to gain skills. There are many vacancies available on the island at the moment, so we hope that this will help. There has been an extremely enthusiastic response, which is good news. The courses were free and covered a wide range of skills over four to five days, including customer service, working in a kitchen, barista skills, basic food prep, CV writing and interview skills. It also included getting a hygiene certificate. Paul Buckland, Head of Hospitality at the College, has been a lecturer in hospitality for 24 years and is a chef by trade. He said, six out of 10 students have ended up with jobs straight away and that's fantastic. That's why we are here. We are tied in with Job Centre Plus and Isle of Wight Jobs and the whole idea is to give lots of support to get people into jobs afterwards. It looks like this could be a rolling programme for us and we have the capacity to meet the demand. Hospitality would suit a lot of people, those with customer experience skills, for example. The industry is looking at increasing salaries and looking at working conditions. I'm a chef by trade and I have had a great career out of it. It's one of the best jobs there are. More courses are planned and there are opportunities for customers, for companies to channel staff through bespoke courses to suit their specific needs. Find out more at Isle of Wight College .ac.uk Country pub is burgled. Two men burgled a one burgled a one of the Isle of Wight's most popular pubs. They broke into the thatched and historic Sun Inn in Halverston and stole a safe, later emptying its contents and discarding it. The police are now investigating the incident which happened on Monday evening. A statement from the pub staff said, We fell victim to a burglary at our beautiful pub. Armed with an axe, two unsavoury individuals smashed their way in and proceeded to steal a safe with our takings, along with other items in it. The safe was recovered in Shawwell. Needless to say, its contents were missing. We have lots of CCTV, see below, which has been passed the police. Anyone with information should contact the police on 101. Last week, the castle in, in Newport was burgled, and there's a photo of um, the two burglars on CCT um, at the bottom of the article. Lifeboat call after Fort Walk. Two men had to be escorted back to shore by the Coast Guard after attempting a Fort Walk on Monday. Bembridge RNLI's inshore lifeboat, RNLB Norman Harvey, was launched to locate and assist the men who had been reported as being in difficulty returning from St Helens Fort. The lifeboat left at 7.30pm at the request of Solon Coast Guard. They quickly found the men who were being escorted back to the beach by Bembridge Coast Guard rescue team, the lifeboat team said. The crew checked there was no one else on or around the fort before returning to station by 8pm. The public have been repeatedly asked by the Coast Guard not to attempt the walks to the fort this year. 
Hospitals new ban on visitors. Tighter restrictions on visitors has been announced at St Mary's Hospital as COVID cases rise. Following last week's announcement that visitors were no longer permitted on certain wards, enhanced restrictions are now in place across all wards. There are exceptions where one family member is permitted to visit. These are for a patient nearing end of life, a child as an inpatient on the children's ward and a birthing partner at the labour ward. A statement said, the decision to restrict visiting across the site is not one we have taken lightly, but due to the continuing rise in COVID-19 patients being treated at the hospital, we must put the safety of our patients and staff first. Visiting for the above exceptions should be agreed with the appropriate ward sister and proof of a negative lateral flow test will be expected. Because we understand how important it is for the welfare of our patients to stay connected with friends and family whilst in hospital, we are continuing to offer our messages to loved ones, to, to a loved one service. To use this service, send a message to our patient experience team at, and I'll read it, IOWNT dot, that's all lowercase, message um, dash two dash love dash ones app n dot h dot s dot net who will make sure your message reaches them. If you are attending the hospital for an outpatient appointment, then you are reminded to attend alone unless in exceptional circumstances, in which case one carer is permitted. Our friendly marshals remain at the front entrances to ensure the reason for your visit is valid and will request to see your appointment letter. Our visiting policy remains under continuous review as soon as we feel it is safe to relax measures once more. We will look forward to welcoming visitors back to the hospital. In the meantime, we ask people for their understanding and support as we continue to take all necessary precautions to keep everybody safe. And I'll just read that um, patient experience team um, uh, again. It's IOWNT dot, that's all lowercase. And all the rest of the, 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 the the letters in lowercase, message dash two dash loved dash ones app n dot h s net. More term start dates delayed by cyber attack. Term start dates have been moved back by more Isle of Wight schools as data collection begins by those hit by a ransomware attack. Two secondaries, three primaries and the island sixth form were targeted by cyber criminals earlier this month and some lost access to their websites and all data. Isle of Wight Education Federation sites, Medina and Carisbrook colleges and the island sixth form were locked out and information was encrypted. Barton and Honeyhill primaries in Newport and Lane's End primary in Cowes were also affected. Some data has already been shared by the Isle of Wight Council in line with agreements, including information previously gathered from the parents and carers. Schools have now emailed families asking them to replace other vital information. Those who have not been contacted need to get in touch with the schools. Honey Hill Primary is using Class Dojo and families at Lane's End Primary should email caroline.cis at Lane's End Primary Isle of White dot school dot UK or Carrie Almond at lanesendprime.low.isleofwhite.school.uk For Barton Primary, email office at bartonpry.isleofwhite.school.uk
questions to the Isle of Wight Education Federation should be sent to data at iwef.org.uk. For all other inquiries, use Carisbrook at iwef.org.uk. Medina at iwef.org.uk or six form at iwef.org.uk. The Isle of Wight Council says it is continuing to work with the schools, police and a cyber security firm. Meanwhile, it says the schools are focused on ensuring start of term runs as smoothly as possible. For the IWEF sites, return dates have been delayed and individual year groups informed. There's no scaffolding news this week. The BBC In Touch programme follows. Paralympic Games, the art of blind photography, In Touch. Recently, there's been some criticism about the Tokyo 220 Paralympic Games going ahead due to a rise in coronavirus cases in Tokyo. Despite this, the Games have commenced and on the show we hear about how they were justified from the President of the International Paralympic Committee, Andrew Parsons. And our reporter, Manny Zambi, is in Tokyo and will be telling us who to look out for and about the atmosphere within the Tokyo site, given the pandemic restrictions. And it may seem unlikely that someone who is completely blind can enjoy photography. But we'll be speaking to professional photographers, Pete Eckert and Karen Visser. Karen Visser is progressively losing her sight and she tells us how pro photography is helping her to adapt. Pete Eckert joins us from Sacramento in California. He's had a plethora of opportunities throughout his career due to his unique style of light photography, including shoots for Volkswagen, Playboy and Sawoski. They'll both be telling us how to do it despite having limited or no sight at all and about what photography means to them. Website photograph 08453 by Pete Eckert. Presenter, Pete White. Producer, Beth Hemmings. And it's goodbye from Leicester. And goodbye from Francis. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Good evening. Tonight we drop in on Tokyo as the Paralympics finally get underway. And we meet two visually impaired photographers, including one who has no sight at all. I could take photos that would mimic how sighted people see, but why would I do that? The world I envision is partly my imagination, but built from all the other senses. All of which confirms there's not much visually impaired people can't do when they put their minds to it. Which is why we start with your very strong responses to our item last week, which confirmed that only around one in four visually impaired people of working age have a job, and that this figure has hardly changed over the past 50 years. So why not? According to Jonathan Fisher, a key factor is who's in charge at the top. I began my teaching career in 1974 with severely limited partial sight in a comprehensive school. After my first full year, I moved to a special school where, before my first day's work, the head made it clear that, despite sitting on the interview panel, he did not want me. After two years or so, I had a transfer to a different comprehensive school where a totally blind colleague was well established. Appointment there was entirely due to the headmaster's enlightened attitude. As for Richard Foster, he feels there's only one conclusion to be drawn from the fact that 90% of employers think it would be difficult or impossible to employ blind people in their companies and 94% of the general public believe that blind people couldn't do their job. Nothing changes. Perhaps it's time to improve benefits for those who the majority of the population think are incapable of working. Being unemployed and living on derisory benefits is bad enough, but we miss out on things like workplace pensions, a social life and the possibility of making lasting friends and even finding partners. 
The current talk around the pandemic is the increase in people with mental health problems for those who are not working or socialising. Well, I have news for the rest of the population. Blind and partially sighted people have had these issues day after day for years. And John is also depressed by the persistence of unrealistic attitudes about the capabilities of blind people. I'm afraid the findings of the survey came as absolutely no surprise to me, both in terms of the numbers and the attitudes of employers and the public generally. There is a huge reservoir of goodwill among the public towards blind and partially sighted people. The genuine kindness and helpfulness that I, and I'm sure others, experience every day is testimony to that. But unfortunately, those good feelings do not translate into the leap of imagination that is required of employers to enable them to understand how someone with a sight impairment may be able to do the job as well as they do without sight. The minister signally failed to answer Peter's questions, not in my view because he was being evasive, but rather because he didn't have any answers. And some would say that we're just about to have proof of John's point with the start of the Paralympics. Huge admiration for the competitors without it necessarily translating into an understanding of what visually impaired people can do in the job market and with their day-to-day lives. But enough of that. Our reporter Manny Jasmi is in Tokyo where the Games are finally about to begin. Although Manny, it has to be said that over here this morning a lot of the reporting was about not sport but about the escalation of Covid, especially in the capital. Is that what you're experiencing as far as what people are saying? Well, as you'll remember, before the Olympics, there was a lot of public dissent against those games going ahead. But Japan had a very good games. They had the best ever games. And I think opposition kind of waned a bit. The irony is that the Covid figures are much worse now than they were before the Olympics. But, yeah, I mean, it's difficult for me to tell you, Peter, because I can't really talk to any of them. <laughs> so is is anyone in the organisation saying out loud that the Games could still, even at this late stage, you know, run into trouble because of the infection rate? No, I don't think there's that feeling publicly, certainly not publicly, but privately also. I mean, this is the biggest ever Paralympics in terms of athletes. There are more athletes at these Games than ever before. And the president of the International Paralympic Committee, Andrew Parsons, says that it's precisely because of the impact of COVID-19 on disabled people that these games must go ahead. The pandemic has disproportionately affected persons with disability around the world. And the Paralympic Games is the only global event that puts persons with disabilities at center stage. So it's the only moment at a global level that they are given the voice. And we believe that this is the moment when they need the voice to be heard the most. So this is, uh, I think it's, it was super important, it is vital that we have these games to bring back uh, disability to the heart of the inclusion agenda. So Manny, that was Andrew Parsons of the International Paralympics Committee. Enough of the politics, how are the athletes making out in these rather unusual circumstances, especially the visually impaired ones? Well, it's important to remember that the athletes still race and uh, swim and lift in the same kind of arenas as they would do in uh, uh, pre-pandemic times. So, you know, they are very much geared up to trying to win or retain Paralympic medals. And, uh, but having said that, it's not the same as as it has been, even in the village. Not much mixing going on between the athletes. I've been speaking to the Dutch totally blind swimmer, Lisette Brownsma, who was at Rio. I'm really glad she was at Rio because that was that would have been a joyous occasion. Um, it's not so much now, but um, she's been talking about that and also telling me how she's able to get around the village independently. You have the guideline on the street so I can find the dining hall myself. And in the elevator there are on the buttons rail so I can feel which uh, floor I, uh, I am. The elevator talks, but but, but I can't understand Japanese. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, I'm blind as well, and I've got Braille in uh, my hotel room, but unfortunately it's Japanese. It's difficult (laughs) to be the buttons uh, on the toilet. (laughs) What's the atmosphere like? You know, have you been able to talk to other athletes from different countries, or is everyone socially distancing? 
a little bit because we changed pins and then you have a little moment to talk to another people but it is less social than other games and we are only with the swimmers in the the elevator we drink no coffee with the other teams of the netherlands and that's a little bit yeah bad but i understand it it's necessary yeah Uh, but it's not fine (laughs) It's really rather sad, isn't it, Manny? Part of the joy of these events is the, you know, the athletes mixing with other teams from different countries and then mixing with the people in the city where the games are held. That's just not going to happen, is it? No, it's not. I mean, this is my third Paralympics. You've been to more. Um, But every other, every single Paralympic Games is characterised by, you know, just seeing athletes out and about. I remember in London 2012, so many of them, just hung out at the Westfield uh, shopping centre, <laughs> just having food there or or just, just browsing. And it was great. You know, you, mm. you always heard journalists say, oh, yeah, I saw so-and-so from the Netherlands team the other day, mm. just buying some trainers. Just briefly, Manny, what's the timetable now, especially uh, the events in which our blind and partially sighted people are taking place? What's, what's happening in the next few days? Well, happily, sport is happening from Wednesday. And um, listeners may remember Elliot Stewart, who was on the program a few weeks ago. He's a judoka who's making his debut uh, in the Paralympics. Judo's coming home, uh, of course, going to Tokyo. And um, by the time we speak next week, it will all be over for him, for good or bad. He's taking part at the end of this week. And Hannah Russell will be defending her 100 metres backstroke title on Sunday in the pool. Uh, Next week, Libby Clegg, the perennial Libby Clegg, will be defending her title in the 200 metres sprint and athletics. Manny Jasmine, try and enjoy yourself in these strange circumstances and thanks very much. And we'll welcome you back next week, hopefully with news of some medals. Of course, sport is only one way of getting fulfilment. But uh, if you've not been a regular listener to In Touch, you might be surprised at the number of visually impaired people whose chosen form of self-expression is photography. Less surprising that people still with useful vision find ways to adapt what they do. But there are even people with no vision who still find satisfaction from taking pictures. I'm going to be joined by one of them. I'll be talking to Pete Eckert in a moment, who joins us from Sacramento in California. Uh, But first, Karen Visser. Uh, You've had poor sight from childhood, which has deteriorated as you've got older. Just explain what photography has meant to you. Initially, um, photography was for me about looking at situations and trying to understand them and particularly observing people. As my sight has changed, I found that it's become more of a tool that's enabling me to see things that I can't see quickly or I miss details. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm missing out now and when I photograph and I go back and look again, like looking twice, I can then see things that I'm now missing. And that's a way also of helping me retain that that memory. However, my sight is deteriorating fairly rapidly. And so that sense of knowing is also changing. And what's happening now is a third approach. And that is I'm finding I don't need to see and register the detail because I'm visualizing and imagining more. What I'm finding with light painting photography is I'm now photographing in complete darkness using a torchlight and a slow shutter release. And it really is from my imagination. I think this brings us rather neatly to Pete as someone who can't see, because surely imagination has to be part of what you do, Pete. I mean, you have retinitis pigmentosa, which is usually a progressive condition. And you've said, I didn't really take photography seriously until I lost all my sight. Just explain what you meant by that. When I uh, do photography, I'm, I'm using the camera as a something to gather light, but I'm using it more as a painter. Uh, a painter conceives what he wants to do, or she may want to do, and, uh, and then works with the canvas. There's a conversation between you and the canvas back and forth. Well, I'm doing the same thing. I'm deciding on what I want to do first, which is different from most photographers. Uh, I'm not going out looking for the shot. I've conceived the shot first, and then I begin to build the image. 
any light that you can have a conception of how much light is there, uh, you can build an image. But Pete, how do you take satisfaction from a picture if you can't see the results? I understand that you can imagine it because you have been able to see, but you don't see the final result, do you? No. I think of it as there's the event, which I have all the control over. It, and I do the work by myself. And then there's the product. And so in the event phase, I memorize everything as I'm building it. I'm using tricks of blindness or skills of blindness, uh, memory, echolocation, touching things. And then I'm building an image. And so I built this image in my mind's eye. That's my bang for the buck. <laughs> After that, I have sighted people, friends usually, describe what the image looks like, and then I match the two. So the top of the car is right there? Yes. You can stand next to me and I'll operate the camera. There is the fire coming over the hood of the car. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, that's exactly what I wanted. It's a, a method of, the camera is a feedback loop for me. Uh, not only in the studio, I, I push myself out into the world and layer images usually between what I do in the studio and what's out in, in the world. See, this is intriguing because, Karen, I know you've said that it's your understanding that the visual memory fades as you lose it. Is not what Pete is saying reassuring in a way? Because clearly he has got ways of hanging on to these memories. Enormously reassuring, and that's helping me plan for the future. Last night in the dark, a friend and I went and photographed alongside the River Cam, and the street lights were very uncomfortable on my eyes, in fact, physically painful. And so it took quite some time. And in the end, I got what I wanted that I had visualized in my mind's eye for weeks on end. I had to get it before I could leave. Mm. And um, this friend of mine, she understood that. Pete, can I just change tack a bit? Because you work as a photographer. You, you work for a number of major companies. Can you just explain that, what you do, and why they trust you? <laughs> Most of these companies have come to me. But in the production, uh, the product that I'm making, I put in, I call it the fingerprints of blindness. You know, how do I differentiate my work from just taking a snapshot? And that's what has caught some curiosity from these companies. Uh, because what I do, they're guaranteed to get results that have never been seen before. I just want to bring you two down to earth a little bit, because, I mean, you are very serious photographers. What about visually impaired people who just want to take a picture of, you know, the dog or, or their children? I mean, what would you say to them? Because they, people may well be thinking, it's not worth it. I can't see anymore. I can't see very much. Why would I take a picture? Peter, I've got recent experience over the past year of lockdown working with multi-story and arts organization in the West Midlands and Sandwell Visually Impaired. And we, we did exactly that because we couldn't meet up. And so we had to find a way and some of the participants are blind and to try and create small digital stories that were important to them and even though they couldn't see we select to help them select images from family albums we we went through a process of audio describing the images so that the words were their own and the feedback i got from that was could we do more could we learn with our phones and our, our ipads or tablets to photograph uh, one person who was quite skeptical to begin with uh, is now photographing his guide dog and wants to download an app to do slow shutter release images at night going for walks with a friend. And it's more that we've captured between all of us collaboratively our imaginations and seeing the possibilities. And I think it's helped alleviate isolation. It's been a talking point with families, you know, um, listening and engaging in the process. Let me just end with Pete and play the role of the sceptic that Karen has rather kind of, uh, you didn't suggest I was, but I probably am a bit as a totally blind person who's never been able to see. You know, isn't there an element in this of holding on to something which has actually gone? You know, some people might say, come on, you, you took photographs when you can see, but is it really a practical thing to do when, when you can't? It's very practical. Um 
for me, my interest in my, what I call my bang for my buck, is the effort of putting together the image. I definitely have a mind's eye image of what's happened. And it's built up over time, layering light on. And so I actually get to see. You know, I, I know what each of my images looks like, and uh, I got what I wanted. And that's the proof for the sighted people that he can actually do this. P. Techart, Karen Visser, thank you both very much indeed. And that's it for today. Do tell us about your own pleasure or perhaps the odd difficulty in photography and also any other perhaps interest that you wouldn't expect a visually impaired person to have. And don't forget, it's a last call for your questions to Ofcom about audio description and how its performance on live or on demand TV could be improved. You can email your comments or questions to intouch at bbc.co.uk. You can leave messages on 0161 836 1338 or you can go to our website bbc.co.uk forward slash in touch from where you can also download tonight's and previous editions of the programme. From me, Peter White, producer Beth Hemmings and studio managers Sue Stone Street and Owen Williams, goodbye.